Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Conversation Design Podcast by Bot Society, where we interview designers and developers and ask them questions about conversation design, creativity, and more. My name is Monica. I'm a product manager at Bot Society, and I will be your host today. On this episode, I interview Greg Bennett, conversation design lead at Salesforce. Greg and I talk about his surprising start in linguistics, working in UX research at Salesforce and Microsoft, the importance of linguistics and conversation design, and more. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Greg. Um, thank you for being with us today on the Conversation Design Podcast. It's a pleasure. Hi, Monica. Please tell us about yourself, um, what your background is, is in, and your role. Sure. So I am the conversation design lead at Salesforce. So I lead all of our efforts for our conversation design practice, which is new. So I'm super excited. This role is a first for Salesforce. I'm our first conversation designer. So I'm very excited to sort of bring to bear my background upon the space and sort of prop up our conversation design practice uh, to be a leader in the field, particularly for our enterprise users. I do work at Salesforce. Our users are indeed great deal enterprise, but we also have mid-market and small business customers as well. But it is a a B2B uh, space in which uh, we provide everything from a chatbot builder for our Salesforce administrators to create text-based chatbots to voice-based solutions for our, uh, our customers. In terms of my personal background and my professional background, I started out in the academic arena studying linguistics. My focus in linguistics was on sociolinguistics, so the language of interpersonal communication, and particularly in online chat. So it really kind of evolved out of a breakup that I had when I was Mm -hmm. an undergrad. (laughs) Um, I was 19 and it was my first major heartbreak I was, you know, chatting with this guy and I got dumped over IM chat and I could feel it coming. I kind of thought to myself at the time, I was like, how is it possible that I can feel someone being distant or distancing themselves from me or being cold when I can't hear his voice, see his face, um, you know, any kind of gestures, any of that. Mm -hmm. Normally we get that through conversation, you know, face to face or even through intonation over the phone. And, you know, as one is very wont to do after one's first major heartbreak, I was like, uh-huh. I have to figure out what happened and unpack uh-huh. it. And so I took a class. It was interesting because I was just signing up for classes, I think for the fall semester. And they offered a class called Text and Talk, which was an introductory course for undergraduate students to the field of conversation and discourse analysis. Mm-hmm. So analyzing using linguistics structures of and patterns of conversation. Mm -hmm. And that was really my foray into using linguistics to understand online chat practices. Um, So that was really, I think, where my passion for linguistics, particularly in chat was born, and how I could then maybe leverage that to eventually, you know, teach machines how to do it. That is fascinating. It's a very interesting story of uh, how you got into it. (laughs) And of course, congratulations on the new role. As you said, you're Salesforce's first uh, conversation designer and all the initiatives that um, Salesforce and you and your team will be working on sound very exciting. Um, so Thank can you, you so much. Us? Yeah. Uh, can you tell us more about your UX and conversation design journey at, at Salesforce so far? Um, what was your role prior to a uh, conversation designer? Sure. So prior to conversation design, I was focused squarely in user research. So I started out at Salesforce four years ago, working on our flagship product, Sales Cloud, as a user experience researcher. And so my main job was to understand the needs and behaviors of our users and sort of gauge their reactions to and perceptions of any kind of new functionality we were producing. Mm -hmm. And I worked on the Sales Cloud product on AI features for about, I would say, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, I kind of caught wind that they were hiring a user experience researcher on Service Cloud, which is our customer relationship management tool for the customer service industry, particularly on our up-and-coming chatbot build product, Einstein Bots. 
And as soon as I heard that, I was like, everybody out of my way. <laughs> because I saw it as a really great opportunity to kind of bring to bear the research that I had done in graduate school, particularly around how users communicate things like, you know, emotion, tone, personality through text. Mm -hmm. And my thought was if I can, you know, given the research that I have done and how I understand these patterns to work, then we can transform those essentially into design tools that we can teach to people who are building chatbots. So for example, you know, do you want your chatbot to come across as a little bit happier or more happy-go-lucky or, or, you know, more highly involved in the conversation? If so, then maybe you have more exclamation points instead of a period at the end of your sentence. Things like mm -hmm. that to kind of linguistically show, okay, this is how you can manipulate the text in order to convey personality. I moved over to the product after a year and a half on Sales Cloud and then was working on user research around how our Salesforce administrators both react to and build bots using the Einstein Bot Builder platform. So I worked on Einstein Bot and the bot builder for about two and a half years. And then that's when we started to develop more voice technology for the customer service industry. Um, and so I've been working on that for about a year. And throughout my entire sort of time working on conversational AI user experience research, I also sort of moonlighted as a conversation designer mm -hmm. because for as much as, you know, we needed to either run experiments or a usability test or a concept evaluation study, we would need some kind of, you know, some kind of user interface of whether it's voice or chat mm -hmm. of the conversation. And we didn't have a conversation designer around. So I went ahead and just produced the conversation designs. And so it was interesting in that between the best practices around conversation design that I have published, as well as the sort of like, you know, kind of moonlighting as a conversation designer on the mm -hmm. side for a year that was really sort of, I think, setting the scene and planting the seeds for our conversation design practice at Salesforce. That's awesome. Uh, we see that a lot, um, how people that now have conversation design roles just started assuming those responsibilities out of having interest in the field. And we've seen it, you know, get paid back in ways like, like it did with you. So awesome. you, mentioned, you mentioned the Einstein bot builder. Tell us more about what, what that is. Sure. So the Einstein bot builder is our platform within Salesforce Service Cloud that essentially allows our Salesforce administrators, anyone who is you know, creating things and building things on the Salesforce platform, to also build a chatbot, a text-based mm -hmm. chatbot. Mm -hmm. And so it's a full-fledged builder application whereby you go in and you can create a singular bot and then create turn-by-turn -turn interactions using a conversational text UI to essentially have a conversation with a customer. And so we've seen that across several different industries. It could be education, it could be retail, consumer goods, all of these different types of industries whereby their customer might have some sort of question that is relatively simple to answer and simple enough that like it sits in that sweet spot between, you know, it's slightly more complicated than maybe pulling a uh, help article for myself as a customer, but mm -hmm. not quite so complicated that I need a human to walk me through mm -hmm. every single piece of it. And that sweet spot is really where we try to sort of guide our customers to build their chatbots. Mm -hmm. So for example, Something that might be better served for, say, you know, a help article might be something like, what's the return policy for an item? And oh. there might be an existing help article for that. But something that's might maybe a little bit more complicated, like, say, for an airline, I want to maybe put on my profile that I have a gluten intolerance and I need a special meal. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more specialized and probably a lot more rare of a, a case type mm -hmm. that it seems like it might not necessarily be the best for a chatbot. And so what we do is we suggest to our users, hey, take a look at your overall caseload within Service Cloud mm -hmm. and see like, okay, what's the channel through which these cases are coming? Because you don't want to move a user from one channel to another. 
and then taking a look at the use case within that particular channel, say, if you already have chat, then what are the most common use cases coming in through chat? Or what are the ones that are maybe coming in through email, something that's text-based as opposed Mm -hmm. to phone or telephony that's voice-based? And then going with those text-based case types and then picking the one that, again, seems like it can fit for having a conversation in terms of explanation, Mm -hmm. but may not necessarily be the best use of a human agent's time. And that's the use case that you want to go with. So once you've decided what the use case is, then you can go in and you can essentially use the dialogue builder, which will allow you to create the conversation design. You Mm -hmm. can also produce rules and actions. And this is really what I think is the key value of the Einstein bot builder. Using these functionalities called rules and actions, it will allow you to take actions on the information that is stored within the Salesforce platform in your instance. So that's really where I think a lot of the power lies. Like if you already have information about this customer, you can use the Einstein bot builder to then pull that information and inform the conversation that the bot is having. Hmm. As opposed to having to, you know, use some sort of other builder out there and create all these custom integrations. That takes a lot of time. Other aspects of the bot builder you can customize, you can true to Salesforce form, you can really customize a great deal of the experience. Mm -hmm. For example, the bot response delay, that's one of my favorite things Mm -hmm. as a linguist, Mm -hmm. because conversation is fundamentally about Mm turn-taking. If only one person is talking in the conversation, that's not a conversation, it's a monologue. Mm -hmm. And so in order to create that turn-taking structure, you have to create some sort of a pause to allow the other speaker or person in the chat to take a turn in the conversation. Mm -hmm. The way that a that you do that using the Einstein bot builder is by using the bot response delay, which is Mm -hmm. fundamentally set at a default of 1.2 seconds. And that's based on field research that we did at Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Or you can, you know, select that you can deselect the default and then delay it to as much as three seconds, which is sort of like the top threshold that we like to set based Uh again on field work that we did of service agents using chat. Mm -hmm. Um, And that allows you to kind of control the cadence of the conversation. You never want to set the conversation, the bot response delay at zero, because it will seem like it's rushing the user. Like you type and you immediately get a response. It feels fake and it feels rushed. Mm -hmm. So that's the Einstein bot builder as a whole. It's It's a really cool platform. Yeah, it sounds like that. So um, the research you mentioned about the um, the delay, is that research you mm-hmm. did while you were working as a UX researcher? Yes, that's right. So when I started out on the team, the folks that I was working with, our UX designer, our product managers, our data scientists, a lot of them had questions about behavior and conversation. And I was able to draw on a lot of the research that I had done as you know in academic linguistics around you know, manipulating the text in order to convey conversational style and personality. But when it came to the bot response delay um, Mm -hmm. and that sort of like cadence of conversation, I hadn't really done any research on that in Mm -hmm. in academia. So then as a user researcher, I thought of, well, if we're going to try and create something that is sort of adheres to how users expect conversation to work in chat, particularly for a customer service use case, we need to then observe how users, particularly customer service agents, are managing those chats right now as it's human to human. Mm-hmm. Because that will tell us what the current experience is. And then based on any kind of pain points we see there, we can improve it. So mm-hmm. we went to uh, my colleague, Molly Mahar, who is the, the UX design lead for Einstein Bots. She and I went mm-hmm. to visit call centers and chat centers in Manila in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Because it's high volume and it's, uh, they have to sort of essentially manage multiple chats at once. So it's very realistic of what a customer service experience might be. And we observed for, I think it was about a, like three or four days. It was the most intense field work I've ever done oh. because I was sick. I was like dying oh. on the plane, got there and only had four days to do our observations yeah. and then turn around and come back. And we were working the graveyard shift because the hours are different. And so they were working U.S. hours. Mm -hmm. So we were in the call center and observing folks. And the thing that I I sort of drew from my training in linguistics to do field observation, Mm -hmm. I was timing the pauses because you can see on the screen in the service cloud console, 
mm-hmm. um, the timestamps for how long, like when when the utterance was sent mm-hmm. in the chat. And so I would write down the timestamps and calculate the essentially the response delay between humans. And I found that on the shortest side, you had something like maybe seven, four to seven seconds. Mm-hmm. And on the longest side, you might have like two minutes, which uh-huh. seems huge. It seems like a really, really huge pause. But if you think about the user on the other side, the mm-hmm. customer is essentially looking for some kind of information. They're doing other things at the same time. They're trying to get whatever answer it is to the question that the agent has provided. And that adds time to the pause from mm-hmm. the user. From the agent, they are handling possibly anywhere from two to six concurrent chats at the same time, mm-hmm. so like six different customers. So that adds an additional delay. And so based on that, my thinking was, okay, if the shortest delay was four seconds, then if we're trying to optimize the conversation for you know efficiency, then we're going to want it to be shorter than four seconds, but not zero, <laughs> because mm-hmm. zero feels fake. And so that's how we ended up at, you know, roughly the 1.2 second marker for the default setting for the Einstein bot response delay, but then also set the sort of top setting of three seconds out that sort of provides that sort of buffer where it still, again, feels, you know, relatively natural, but not too long. By you talking about all of this, um, I've been thinking, how much is and why is UX research important in building a bot? I think there's sort of two answers to that. Because if you're building a bot builder, like we built at Salesforce, so like you have built at Bot Society, mm-hmm. UX research is super important because you have to understand you're building a tool for someone else to use to build something. Mm-hmm. And so rather than necessarily thinking of only the end user experience, you also have to think about that administrator experience. What are the things that they're going to need? Like the metaphor I like to think of is if you're trying to make it such that your customers can deliver a table, then you have to think through what are the tools that you need to give your customer for them to build a table and Mm -hmm. like not a bad table either, right? Like you don't want them to build a table with only like two legs or one leg, Mm -hmm. right? Like you want it to be sturdy. And so in order to get at that experience for admins, you really have to conduct research with them to understand, is the tool too complex? Is it lightweight enough? Does it give them all of the resources they need to be able to produce that full-fledged experience for their end users? If you yourself are building chatbots for customers, you're not necessarily building a chatbot builder platform. Mm -hmm. Then UX research is super important because, I mean, when it comes to the conversation design, we all have assumptions about how conversation works. We develop those assumptions based on who we grow up having conversations with, the people that we encounter over the course of our lives. The way that we experience conversation over time is what some linguists refer to as conversational competence. We develop that conversational competence by interacting with a bunch of people Mm -hmm. when we're younger. And therefore, we have this sort of set of assumptions about how conversation should go. But the people who we interact with over, you know, the course of our adolescence and childhood, they are, you know, part of a local community. And so Mm -hmm. culturally, the way that they speak might be a little bit different than, say, how people speak in another community. So I grew up here in the Bay Area of California. My Mm -hmm. perception and sort of understanding of a norm of conversation is that you don't have as much conversational overlap. If you are taking a pause in conversation, it means that you are ceding the floor of the conversation to someone else for them to speak and take a turn. Mm -hmm. And that only one voice should be heard at a time in conversation. Mm -hmm. But if you're, say, maybe from New York City, then you may have grown up in a community whereby taking like only one voice heard at at a time in conversation is boring. And conversation is more of like a fun game or a sport where everyone's talking at the same time and that's what makes it energetic. Mm -hmm. And so that really is the locus of research that came from um, one of my uh, mentors, Deborah Tannen. The core of her research really is about conversational style. And she was the first linguist to discover these sort of characteristics of conversational style in that way. And she made that exact comparison in her book, Conversational Style whereby, you know, people who were from California had kind of maybe some troubles talking with people from New York because the people from California tended to pause a lot more and the (laughs) the people from New York tended to not. And so 
I think all of that to say is that wherever you're from, you're going to have assumptions about how conversation, quote unquote, should be. And when you think about it that way, it's like there's, it's like you're saying there's a right and wrong way to have conversation. Mm -hmm. And there's not, it's all just variation. So in order to sort of like unpack your assumptions, you have to conduct UX research to figure out, you know, did I make an assumption about conversational pacing or asking a question or saying sorry or using emojis? Any of those things, you're going to have to pressure test that. And so conducting usability testing or concept evaluations on the conversation design is super important. Yeah. And I definitely see that even personally. So I'm from Kosovo uh, in Southeast uh-huh. Europe and I studied in the US and I've spent mm-hmm. quite some some years here. So um, uh-huh. living in the Northeast in Boston and now in California. And I do oh, yeah. think that my conversation style has definitely changed based on where I'm living. And so if I totally. go home, it's very different. I take more pauses. Yeah, people there don't speak faster than me, and yep. sometimes it <laughs> leads to confusion. And like, where are you from? I'm like, yeah. I'm from here. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting, like taking that and thinking about a chatbot that works in multiple languages, or especially oh, now with sure. more with more and more voice bots. Um, you can yes. have you know the same bot from the same company with the same personality but it will mm-hmm. have to have this variation based on the culture that it's interacting with. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's really important to also understand about your user base, where they come from. And it's also like what you said, it's not just where you were born or where you lived you know, when you were younger, but where you've sort of spent a considerable amount of time over the course of your life. Mm -hmm. So for example, I spent a lot of time in Japan. And Mm -hmm. so my conversational style has sort of shifted a little bit in that Japanese uses a lot of indirectness Mm -hmm. in conversation in order to convey a request. And Mm -hmm. so as a result, sometimes I've been a little too indirect in English sometimes Uh where I should have just said, close the window, as opposed to it's a little cold today, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and you can kind of, right? So like you can kind of see the difference there. And I think it's important to understand, you know, who is my population of users? If mm-hmm. I know that, let's say, you know, the majority of my users from my company are from the southern, you know, states of the United States of America, well, then my conversational style needs to be very different than say, if all of my customers or the majority of my customers are from, you know, Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And so through again like what are those conversational style differences both regionally and culturally and then when it comes to voice making sure like it's not uh like you said it's not a one and done mm-hmm. like i think one thing that i've noticed in my research is that and understandably so a lot of administrators or people who are building bots or voice assistants want to do one conversation design and then deploy it to all channels. Mm -hmm. And that's really going to mess you up because the way that you talk in chat is not the same way that you talk in voice. Like imagine if you, and I actually have used Bot Society to illustrate this exact example Mm -hmm. where I took a chatbot UI that had, you know, like when you see chatbots, you have those menu items that are listed Mm -hmm. there which, you know, we call the menus in the Einstein bot builder. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I just copied a whole existing conversation design from a text-based chatbot, including the menu, and then put it in bot society and then had essentially it read out the whole thing in a voice experience using Mm -hmm. the Alexa voice. And it sounded terrible (laughs) because Mm -hmm. it violates the one breath principle. It's too much, you know, it's too much verbiage at once. It's not how you would talk in voice. And so, again, like there's affordances of using text, affordances of using voice and limitations of each. And so mm-hmm. thinking through, okay, all right, who's my target audience? And, you know, what are the essentially the patterns of conversation given, you know, the, the medium or the channel? So while we're speaking about this and the importance of uh, linguistics as well in mm-hmm. bot builders and doing conversation design, um, do you think bot builders currently are focused enough on linguistics? And how would you improve or change the way conversation design is being done? 
Yeah, I think overall bot builders are focused on a certain area of linguistics maybe than another. So what I mean by that is I think bot builders are focused a lot more, I think, on the syntax and the semantics of part of linguistics, like that sort of like traditional theoretical foundation part of linguistics, like, you know, what is the sentence actually comprised of or what is the sort of like locus of meaning behind this sentence rather than what is the structure and flow of the conversation? Heidi Hamilton, who is a uh, professor at Georgetown University of Discourse Analysis and Linguistics, she has the saying um, when we were in school, she had the thing called where she said, conversation is like climbing a tree that climbs back. And I really, really love that phrase because it's so true. Like conversation fundamentally, like I said earlier, if only one person is talking, it's not a conversation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, conversation is fundamentally a collaboration. And so where the conversation is going, it's co-constructed. I can as much as like, if I wanted to shift this conversation that we're having towards, you know, Marvel and the Avengers, it doesn't matter how much I turn the the conversation in that direction, you have to follow or accommodate me. Uh And so if you think about it, like there, I think a lot of bot builders think of conversation as a linear format, like you start Mm -hmm. from point A and go to point B, when really like, it's not a straight line between point A and point B. It's like it expands with a bunch of branches and it changes and flows. And so I think conversation is less linear and more spherical in nature, whereby you might move from different nodes on the sphere of conversation to another based on these sort of like ties of connection across that network. And then maybe, you know, circle back or or come back to the top. And that's really where I think chatbot builders could kind of grow in the future. Mm -hmm. So in the podcast, we take uh, questions from some of our community members. I have a question from Miriam at ICSI asking, how did you move from linguistics to uh, UX? Awesome. Well, thanks for that question, Miriam. Actually, I started out after I finished graduate school, just taking a break because I was really just sort of trying to figure out you know, what is it that I really, really want to do? Like, I didn't want to look back after having, you know, say, gone into an academic route and think, "Ah, I didn't try anything else. So I took a year off after graduate school. And very sort of serendipitously, I had an advisor in grad school, Anna Marie Trester, who sent me an email saying, hey, Microsoft is hiring a researcher, and they want someone who know something about ethnography and conversation. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? How does Microsoft even know what those things are, let alone care (laughs) to research them? Like I'd always just sort of assumed after studying linguistics in school that unless I studied computational linguistics or was a quantitative researcher, Mm -hmm. there was no room for me in the tech space. So what I did at the time was I just, I knew nothing about what was going on. Like I didn't even have a resume. I just had my academic CV (laughs) <laughs> and so I forwarded the email that I got from Anna to the hiring manager, hoping that, you know, the hiring manager at Microsoft would recognize someone in the thread mm-hmm. that, you know, in that email. And I just said, hey, I'm interested in this role. I'd love to chat more. And then I attached my CV for their reference. Mm-hmm. And luckily that worked because yeah. they, yeah, they, they emailed me back and said, hey, can you come in for an interview? And it was to work on Cortana, which is Microsoft's mm. uh, voice assistant solution. Wow. And that was really my foray into UX. I had no idea what UX was <laughs> when I got there. And I was very lucky to have a researcher who was more senior to me at the time, Lisa Pezenson, who took me under her wing and taught me sort of the ropes of user research and sort of how to start thinking about transferring my skills in qualitative research from sociolinguistics into an, a, a much more applied role mm-hmm. of experience research. And so after that, I decided, okay, am I just really into this because I like tech or am I into it because I'm new to it or not as new to it in terms of like research skills, but it's a field that I hadn't necessarily considered before. So I did a brief stint in search relevance at Yahoo Mm -hmm. and then realized, okay, yeah, user research is really what makes me feel alive. It makes Mm -hmm. me feel inspired. 
I was sneaking off to the user research labs at Yahoo <laughs> when I had a spare time to help the researchers there. And then um, eventually from there, that's how I ended up at Salesforce in U- UX research full time. That's awesome. There's a big transition from sneaking to help <laughs> the UX researchers to flying to Manila and doing the- totally <laughs> totally actually i've never thought of it that way before but thank you for mentioning it because <laughs> like yeah what a journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah so which skills um from linguistics have you seen really translate into ux research yeah i think the first one would be pattern recognition so as linguists we'll get homework in school like all right here's a sentence in Runyan Kore, which is a language in Africa. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how to speak anything in that language. Mm-hmm. And the I mean is to figure out, okay, all right, so what does every piece of the sentence mean? And what's the translation in English with just like a few key hints. Mm-hmm. And the whole task is to be able to understand, okay, what are the patterns here? Like, what are the, all the pieces of the words and mm-hmm. how do they sort of fit together? And then what do they have in common with other pieces that we see in the data set? And then from those common threads, how can we then make judgment or make a call based on the patterns that we see? Mm-hmm. And so that's from a morphology class or even uh, in syntax about creating some sort of argumentation to defend your explanation of what's going on or the pattern that you see. Syntax was a really challenging class for me because it's kind of like math. You Mm -hmm. have to essentially see how the sentence is sort of generated given all these different rules in the grammar. And then from that, you have to justify how it came to be using a proof. And at the time, I hated it. Like when I had hair on my head, I would pull my hair out. I have no (laughs) hair on my head now, so I can't do that. But I would get so frustrated because I was like, you know, how do I, how do I really show my thinking and explain all, you know, anchoring it in the language that we see and the patterns that we see there, my justification for why this phenomena is the way it is. And so all that to say is between the pattern recognition and the sort of argumentation skills that you learn in linguistics, I think that really prepares you in UX to be able to show, okay, you know, I did a qualitative study where I interviewed maybe, you know, five to 10 users about this thing. Mm -hmm. And here, like in this entire sea of unstructured data, here's a pattern. And now I can use clear argumentation based on those, you know, those, those data insights that I can sort of pinpoint Mm -hmm. in the unstructured set and say, here's the reason why what I'm recommending is worth listening to. Here's the reason why this behavior or this pattern is has credence. And so I think that's, I think, the sort of fundamental principle. And then particularly for sociolinguists, I would say anything that you learn in a sociolinguistic field methods class is super helpful. Like for sociolinguists, again, like the the objective is to research language and practice or language as it gets used in conversation and in the wild, in society. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Part of that is, you know, there's a field of sociolinguistics that's really interested in things like humans' accents and, you know, particularly how they say the pronunciation of a word, for example, might be different in one region of the U.S. or than another. Mm-hmm. And that can be due to a bunch of different factors. It could be due to socioeconomic status. It could be due to race, sexuality, gender, identity, region, you name it. And if you're trying to sort of capture that data on tape, you don't want to bias your participant by saying it out loud. So I had to do an assignment in Washington, D.C., where we, you know, in D.C., there's a, there's multiple ways that you can say the word orange. Sometimes mm-hmm. they say the word orange. But I don't want to bias my participant in the study by saying, can you say the word orange for me? Because then they might be more likely to repeat mm-hmm. that, that pronunciation that I just created. So mm-hmm. it's almost kind of like playing the game taboo. Like if you've ever played that at, party or or something like that although we don't really have very many of those anymore (laughs) um i'd have to say things like okay how do you get to vienna which is a stop on the orange line in the dc metro system Mm -hmm. in hopes that they oh you have to get in the orange line Mm -hmm. and so again that's just an example of if you're asking a user a question you can't ask them do you like this feature yes or no because Mm -hmm. they're more likely to agree with it than say no it's going to lead them to think and so 
thinking more open-ended and asking these more open-ended questions. Again, I think sociolinguistic field methods also really help prepare you. Mm -hmm. So when I was considering the transition from linguistics to user research and UX, it actually didn't seem like a huge jump. Like I went through, there's a methods book by Kathy Baxter, Catherine Courage, and uh, Kelly Kane called Understanding Your Users. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great handbook that I recommend to everybody explains the methods of user research in really great detail. And as I was going through each section, I was like, oh, I know how to do this. It's just called something different in UX Mm -hmm. than it was in. Those do sound like very relatable, like skills to have, even in conversation design, not just translating from linguistics to UX research, but also in like recognizing speech patterns and in conversations. That's something we've been working on at Boss Society, how do we pick up on these patterns and make it easier to design for them? Well, you know, with repair paths and from your lens, like what a conversation is like, how do you imagine a conversation? Yeah, I, like when I'm doing conversation design? Yeah, or as a, yeah, as a I, linguist in conversation design, uh, when you're mm, thinking about testing. Totally. So I think... As a linguist, and even as a conversation designer, because of my training in linguistics, I think I always sort of start by imagining the conversation as I would transcript, because that's how we work with conversation in discourse analysis. It's written out in a transcript, and there's very specific transcription conventions to show things like a pause or a false start or repetition or when there's overlapping speech. All of those things are how, because of my training, that's how I visualize it. Mm -hmm. But I also recognize that as a conversation designer, that's not necessarily, it it can look kind of dry and technical. So not all of my stakeholders, like my product managers or my engineers um, or my data scientists might be comfortable visualizing the conversation in that way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll work with someone who's better at visual design to create kind of like a storyboard that shows Mm -hmm. how the conversation looked between two people, or let's say in this case, a machine and a person to kind of show that concept up front. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm actually trying to deliver a conversation design for the system, I like to, and this is going to sound really basic, but I like to use Google Sheets because that way it allows me to kind of like show again if they're like it's easy to show if two people are talking at the same time or two participants are talking at the same time but also it and this is something that i've found especially helpful is i can create a third column beside the user and the the agent or the assistant Mm -hmm. called design notes where i get to essentially write my explanation of the design choices that i made And I think that's really important because it will convince my stakeholders of the importance and the meticulous decisions that went into the conversation design. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I decide to start an utterance from the bot with so, that's called a discourse marker in linguistics. And discourse markers are a phenomenon of linguistics that were discovered by uh, Deborah Schifrin. Mm -hmm. Um, And... Essentially, the discourse marker so shows a relationship between information within the conversation. That's all mm-hmm. or all. That's what discourse markers do. They show the relationship between information within the conversation. And so has the meaning of therefore or, you know, ergo. Mm-hmm. And so in that regard, you can use the word so as a way to show, okay, all right, given whatever was just said in conversation, then this is then whatever I'm about to say. There's mm-hmm. that relationship between what came before and what came after. And so if I want to essentially convey that sense of or that deeper understanding to the end user that the system truly does recognize the relationship between what you said and what it says it's about to do, Mm -hmm. using the discourse so at the front of the utterance as opposed to well or okay can really make a big difference in terms of that experience. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, those small words like so, well, but, okay, you know, get sort of dismissed because it's not something that we're taught to in like speech rhetoric mm-hmm. use. A lot of times, you know, when you're trying to learn how to give a, a speech or a talk, you might get advice saying, yeah, don't use those quote-unquote filler words. 
But mm-hmm. those filler words are actually discourse markers and they have meaning and they're really mm-hmm. important in showing the cohesion of information in a conversation. Mm-hmm. And so for a conversation designer, it's really important to use those strategically. And that's why I like to kind of write in the design notes like, no, I didn't just sort of whimsically, willy-nilly toss these tiny words about. Mm-hmm. And no, we can't get rid of them. And here's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's helpful to have the background of uh, of linguistics to like understand that those are crucial parts of a conversation. Do you also think linguistics helps manage the user's expectations of a bot? Yes. So one key discourse marker that I say that we should never use is um. Mm-hmm. And that's because um from my perspective, really kind of tends to signify cognitive processing, like you're thinking about something or you're kind of processing or hesitating. And it's not to say that the system won't be processing something, but for it to say, um, to indicate that processing, I think comes across as very much like you're kind of trying to fake the user out. You're Mm -hmm. trying to sort of trick them into thinking that they're talking to a human when they're not falls very squarely in that uncanny valley. And so that's something where I would say, okay, like, don't use that. I would say, yeah, things like that. Or even like we were talking about earlier with a bot response delay, Mm -hmm. where, you know, if we're like, because very much so we have a a strong policy at Salesforce about making sure that it's extremely clear to the end user, you are talking to a machine and not to a human. Because our number one value at Salesforce is trust. And you don't want to burn the trust of your user by Mm -hmm. lying to them and saying that they're talking to a human when they're talking to a machine. And so part of that is also encoded in the language. So things like, um, or, you know, trying to sort of like make the bot response delay, quote unquote, too human. All of those things I would say are important aspects to consider when it comes to conversation design. How do you think about personalizing a conversation with a bot and the importance of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, regarding the importance of personalizing a conversation with a bot, I would say, like, well, I think just maybe a quick question. When you say personalizing, is it more like the personality of the bot or making the bots sort of personal to the user? We'll talk about the personality in a bit, but this is in particular. Pulling like the background information you have about oh. the bot has about the user to make a more custom experience. Okay, then yes, I, I mean both of them I think are very important, but particularly when trying to essentially make the experience as optimal as possible mm-hmm. for your user. Again, because I'm a user researcher, it's very important that I understand who it is that mm-hmm. I'm working on a product for, and so. Again, given that everyone has a conversational style, a way of talking, their conversational competence, and that that varies given sort of these cross-cultural aspects, Mm -hmm. that understanding who your target user is and what they value and how they talk is going to be super important because creating relationships between people, between customers, between company and customer is all, I think, very much predicated on these essentially like alignments between their conversational styles. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say your target user is maybe kind of like, you know, like a teenager or, or a teenage group, and they come from a major metropolitan area, let's say maybe New York, and they're really into like online, uh, gaming, for example. Mm -hmm. then your conversational style is going to have to be inherently different for that than, say, for maybe a fashion company that's trying to sell clothes for teenagers in, say, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And so thinking through, okay, for the gaming community who are more of the teenage side within New York, how do they talk? Maybe doing some online kind of, quote-unquote, ethnographic digging, like Mm -hmm. trying to figure out who these populations are, how do they talk in online forums, how do they chat, do they use emojis or not? Like, yeah. imagine if, let's say, this population doesn't use emojis and use emojis with them using mm-hmm. the bot, like, how are they going to develop that trust or that that relationship with, that rapport with the bot? Mm-hmm. So really understanding not just, 
you know, who is your user, but how do they talk is going to mm-hmm. be really crucial to personalizing it. And so that is also carried over to the personality of the bod regarding voice mm-hmm. and tone. How do you decide on the personality and keep the bot personality consistent when working on an enterprise bot? Yeah, I think it's really important to essentially like at the beginning of it, write out and sort of write a spec document that outlines the quote unquote personality of the bot. Mm. And as a linguist, when I hear, you know, what's my bot's personality, what I, what I really interpret that as is what is my bot's conversational style? Mm -hmm. Because you sort of convey your own personal identity in conversation through the way that you use your language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you talk really fast or you ask a lot of personal questions or you have, you know, you tend to overlap with the other customer, that's called a high involvement conversational style. Mm -hmm. Um, And this again comes back, comes from Deborah Tannen's research Mm -hmm. whereby you see conversation as this energetic sport-like activity whereby, you know, asking a lot of questions and keeping it moving at a fast pace. And, you know, everybody's talking at once. That's engaging. That's exciting. That's what sort of makes you want to have conversation. Mm -hmm. That, I would say, is important to outline. If you know that your user population is, you know, exhibits that conversational style, then your bot should also try to exhibit some of those traits. Now, that also has to be reconciled against the brand of your company or your organization. So let's say that you're a customer that's like a coffee shop, and mm-hmm. you're kind of like a maybe a little bit more of a high end coffee shop, and you have this minimalist design, and it's somewhat quiet, but not overly ebullient or loud. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, then, you know, if your user population is high involvement and they are, you know, they ask a lot of personal questions, they talk really fast, they're really energetic, whatever, then you're going to have to find some way of expressing those qualities without violating the boundaries of your brand. So Mm -hmm. maybe it means, okay, you don't use emojis, but you reduce the bot response delay to as low as possible, like maybe 1.2 seconds or, Mm -hmm. you know, half a second or something that makes the pace of the conversation a little bit faster Mm -hmm. or maybe instead of using a lot of um, exclamation points for example you might like ask a couple more personal questions about the user like how's your day going i would say you know yeah instead of maybe again like leaning overly in the direction of okay we're going to send a ton of images in the chat and gifts in the chat whereby that maybe deviates a little bit from the more buttoned up brand that your organization has, maybe you ask a couple of more questions about the user that are, you know, targeted toward them and less about the overall transaction that's at hand. So maybe instead of, you know, at the end, thanks, is there anything else that I can do for you? You could say something like, thanks, what do you think about this new coffee? Or, you know, something like that to kind of get their opinion on something, learn a little bit more about Mm -hmm. them where it's not too personal, but it also shows to them that you're uh, trying to learn more about them, that's very much in line with a high involvement conversational style, Mm -hmm. where again, you're not violating the the bounds of your brand. That said, you also have to know, like, let's say it was the the inverse, where your brand is this super bubbly, like hip, and you know, there's lots of stickers and emojis and images and stuff that go with your brand. And so you use those in your chat, but your end users are more like high considerateness, which is what Deborah Tannen calls another conversational style where there's, you know, less conversational overlap, not as many questions. The, there's a clear pause between turns of conversation. Mm-hmm. The rate of speech might be a little bit slower. Um, someone kind of more like me. In that case, you are going to want to maybe like try to dial it back a little bit in the sense of, Like, let's say you're going to make an apology to the user. Like, I think we can all sort of agree that when it comes to customer service, issuing an apology is a very common and necessary piece of the customer service experience. Mm -hmm. Because whether it's, you know, the bot has reached the limitations of what it can provide for the customer and now it has to escalate to a human agent, then you would want to apologize. Or if, if the user is upset, about something or there was a mistake that happened or they can't connect to their account or whatever, 
that you would also want to apologize for that. And when you're issuing an apology, again, let's say that the brand voice and tone is happy-go-lucky, and you say something like, oh, I'm so sorry, exclamation point, exclamation point, you know, happy emoji, heart, thumbs up. Like mm-hmm. that might adhere to the, the happy-go-lucky brand, but then when it comes off in conversational style, it might be interpreted as sarcastic. Mm-hmm. Because when it comes to issuing an apology, the emojis might essentially give a a tone to the overall apologetic message mm-hmm. that conflicts with something like apologetic. Rather, it's like, oh, you seem to be really happy that I am experiencing something not so great. And so while you're saying you're sorry, you have these happy inflections at the end, and mm-hmm. that comes across as sarcastic. So yeah. thinking through again, like trying to, again, when I had mentioned like, okay, if you're creating sort of like a guideline sheet about what the bounds of the personality um, or conversational style of the bot is, making sure to also articulate okay, when do we deviate from that style? If I'm issuing an apology, do we do we tone it down? Do we tone mm-hmm. it up? Things like that. That's super helpful. And um, kind of going back to when you were talking about violating the bounds of, of the brand or not necessarily violating, but being mindful of the, the boundaries mm-hmm. um, of the brand and when you deviate from that, we got a question a great question from Alina, who's a student at UC Berkeley, asking awesome. about chatbots being used in more empathetic industries. So until now, we we I think the examples have been more about businesses mm-hmm. right, talking to customers, which is a very important relationship. But more specific in like uh, how she phrased it, empathetic industry. So counseling, therapy, mentorship. Oh, yeah. How do you see chatbots being used in those industries? And how is that different? Yeah. So I, thanks for the question, Alina. I think it's a really good one. I That actually reminds me of something I saw in a workshop at CHI, the Computer Human Interaction Conference, I want to say maybe two or three years ago. So I was in a workshop on chatbots, and someone had presented a paper whereby they had found in their research, that users actually tended to engage more or have sort of longer or more in-depth conversation with machines for these exact use cases, like therapy or counseling. This perception, I think, that users are understanding that, okay, I am talking to a machine, and it's not going to go to the break room and possibly tell someone else my thoughts or my feelings. And so there's this sense of anonymity, but also privacy, I think, that that is perceived about about bots, Mm -hmm. in which case we can sort of leverage that to sort of help scale, especially now in a time like this, you know, in the age of COVID-19, whereby, you know, all of our resources are strapped, and people, I think, need counseling and therapy more than ever, Mm -hmm. um, talk and communicate and get that out. And I think we're seeing a little bit more of a proliferation of counseling and therapy bots, Based and and good reason with good effect in the sense of people can confide in them without sort of maybe wondering, okay, how is this information going to possibly, you know, spread in some way? So I think it really comes down to, again, trusting the platform that the bot is built on, making sure that it's secure and that the information that the user or the client is providing is, again, very much kept private and maintained in that secure way but also very inherently in the understanding that in talking to a machine, the machine isn't going to make any judgments about you. Mm-hmm. It's not going to like sit there and, and possibly think or, or analyze you in some way. It's just there to listen. Mm-hmm. Whereas no matter how much you're talking with a human, especially if it's like my therapist or whomever, there's always even a slight possibility that there's some kind of analysis or commentary that's being made, mm-hmm. even if it's just inside their head. And so I think that perception also kind of lends itself to users possibly opening up even more Mm -hmm. and really kind of getting some a a different sense of catharsis out of the experience. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a different way of speaking to a user? So say you're a conversation designer on Mm -hmm. a chatbot for counseling. I think there will be different things to keep in mind when writing conversations and designing for that versus... Um, designing for, you know, a regular business chatbot? Yeah, I think 
Part of it is, again, very much reflecting back to the user that they have been heard. Mm -hmm. And so in linguistics, we call that, and you and I have been doing this throughout our entire conversation just now. Every time you go, "Mm mm-hmm, and I go, yeah, and things like that, that's called (laughs) back-channeling in linguistics, where you give these small cues to the other user, or other user, (laughs) the other speaker, that, hey, I'm listening, I hear you, I get it. And so that's going to be really important because when it comes to things like counseling and therapy, the most important thing I think for the end user is for them to feel like they're being listened to, for them to feel heard. And so, again, if we're trying to facilitate an experience whereby the user is just trying to sort of get their feelings out, Mm -hmm. the way to, I think, facilitate that in a way that's more than just sort of talking to a wall or talking out into the void is by building in some of that back channeling to essentially keep the user talking. Again, if the objective really is to get the user to just sort of vent um, and get their feelings out, knowing that the catharsis from that can be really helpful in a time of isolation, Mm -hmm. then adding words like, "Uh uh-huh, or wow, in the case of something that's extreme, or, oh, that's interesting, or, oh, I see. The discourse marker O shows, it marks the receipt of information. So leveraging that discourse marker a lot, I think coupling that with back channeling of having these, again, small sort of utterances that go back to the user that confirm to the user that the machine is listening, I think would be helpful. And particularly because it's a machine, it's also less to sort of say, hey, I'm listening to you and also more to convey like, hey, I'm functioning (laughs) because the bot isn't going to be saying much back, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so the assumption is that like, if there's like a a really, really long pause from the bot side, the user might start to think like, hey, A, are you still there? B, Mm -hmm. are you still functioning? And C, like, does this thing work? And Mm -hmm. that's, I think all of that can can kind of be remedied with the combination of discourse markers and back channeling. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you for that. And we're reaching the end of the podcast. So um, I have a couple more questions more specific to um, your process and your advice. So what inspires you? Anything you listen to, music, you anything you watch, read, to, mm. to get inspired to do the work that you do? Um, let's see. What inspires me? I think part of it, I would say, is my parents. Mm -hmm. And my friends and like family who I think they know that I'm already sort of inherently interested in this. And therefore, they all sort of come to me to complain about the terrible experience they might Mm -hmm. have with their voice assistant or a chatbot online. Uh And I feel very inspired by those moments to then think through, how can I fix this? Mm -hmm. How can I make this better for, for the people around me? So that's certainly, I think, a personal inspiration. Um, but also like in popular media, this is going to sound, uh, maybe I'm revealing a, a little bit too much about my media taste these, <laughs> these days, but every week, uh, some friends of mine from college and I will sit down and have a Netflix party mm-hmm. and we've are sort of like, like choice of TV shows as of late have been like, you know, kind of like trashy reality TV. <laughs> and so we've been, uh, we've been watching this uh, show called too hot to handle. Mm -hmm. which is not safe for work. So I don't recommend it for work. (laughs) However, they do have this voice agent, like this, like Alexa type, you know, like bot Uh on the show that talks to all the participants, to all the contestants. And one of my friends from college, she is a graduate student in computer science. And she also works on NLP. And the whole time she and I just sit back and we're like, fake, not real, fake, or (laughs) and, and trying to sort of sort of unpack the and the other one in the conversation she in the netflix party she's a linguist so uh-huh. we all make commentary on how like okay how do we know that this isn't real or it's mm-hmm. been edited or yeah. how this didn't fairly work that way and so it's a kind of fun way to sort of keep the skills alive but also mm-hmm. think through okay if we think that this is fake like how would we make it more real or if this is the north star like whether it's that or it's, you know, uh, Friday or Edith or, or Jarvis from, you know, mm-hmm. the Avengers and Iron Man or uh-huh. Rita from Star Trek, like all of these conversational agents we see in popular media, that really is setting the our, you know, the consumer expectation for where yeah. bots are going and what their expectations are. 
how can we get there to kind of meet that? Mm -hmm. And then particularly, how can we also mitigate it from possible like risk or possible harm that it could do to participants? Like one really interesting, so spoiler alert, if you are watching Too Hot to Handle and haven't watched like episode three or four yet, skip over the next 10 seconds of what I'm about to say. (laughs) But there's a part in a series where the voice assistants will kind of tattle on the uh, contestants a little bit what are the ethics around that? Like, what are the ethics around, or, you know, the sort of values around the machine, keep quote unquote, keeping secrets? I mean, imagine Mm -hmm. if we're thinking about, you know, a voice assistant inside of a home where it's family, is it okay for the parent to go in and be like, all right, so like, did, you know, Johnny and Sally do their homework today, that kind of a thing. Um, So really starting to unpack some of that. Also, I think uh, it's a good inspiration in terms of like a thought experiment around where these things could go and what we would need to do to meet those expectations. Yeah, for sure. That actually sounds really interesting. I think it should be research for my job too. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it's so funny because I'm like, I wouldn't have expected to get that kind of inspiration from that kind of a TV show. <laughs> and I don't mean to like demean it, but it's like, for example, I had one of my friends from college, she sits around and she was just asking me yesterday. She was like, why do we keep watching these reality TV shows? I want to watch a documentary. <laughs> I was like, wow, I feel really judged right now. <laughs> but um, that like, even still, I'm like, I, I find learning and inspiration in the world around me, no matter what's going on. And so even if it is something like, you know, a reality TV show that you otherwise might think doesn't provide a lot of intellectual value, I still got some intellectual value out of it because it's saying, okay, like, all right, this is how these producers have framed and positioned this voice assistant within, you know, a social environment, what is that then setting expectations for, for consumers and users? And what do I need to then start thinking about and researching and, you know, designing in order to help mitigate and also frame that future in the, yeah, in the future. Yeah. I think it is this curiosity that clearly you very much have um, that's helped you (laughs) From from role to role, from from field to field, uh, let's end with your advice for people seeking to transition from either linguistics or UX or another field to conversation design. Oh yeah, I would say for linguistic to conversation design, that actually seems like a slightly easier transition in that you are already trained in essentially in the framework of the UI itself that you'll be building. Mm -hmm. So because the UI itself is conversation, if you're coming from linguistics, you're used to working with language as an interface, whether that's analyzing the data or, you know, trying to produce something from it, an analysis of some sort. So I think the jump from conversation analysis or discourse analysis or linguistics is not as far for conversation design. I would say if you are a linguist and you're considering becoming a conversation designer to start actually trying out the tools that are out there like Bot Society or Einstein Bot Builder to start really essentially getting familiar with how you would go about producing something like that. If you are, say, a UX designer who is interested in conversation design and wants to shift from designing experiences for a graphical UI to more of a conversational like voice or chat UI, then I would say maybe... One of the first things I would do is read this book by Deborah Tannen called That's Not What I Meant. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the biggest sort of challenges with folks who have never worked on conversation in any capacity before kind of assume that because they can have a conversation successfully, that that means that they're like essentially good at it or they're an expert at it. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that that like, I don't think there is such a thing as someone who is quote unquote, good or expert at conversation, because conversation is highly variable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in order to communicate the point about how conversation is just, it's just a variable thing rather than making a judgment call on it. I highly recommend that book. That's not what I meant by Deborah Tannen, because it shows, okay, you know, my way of speaking isn't necessarily the right way of speaking. Mm -hmm. And really kind of starting to unpack those assumptions that you know, I might have about language and how it quote unquote should or should not be used. 
every time I see someone online saying like, oh, you shouldn't talk like that, or oh, you should, you know, put, you know, a comma before and or (laughs) whatever in a list and use the Oxford comma, all those types of things where I just kind of think, you know, language, it's, it's, it's created by the people who use it. Mm -hmm. And so who are we to say that there's something wrong about the way a a user uses language? Mm -hmm. Um, It's all about the sake of trying to communicate and conversation is highly messy. And so trying to operationalize that in some way, I think comes a lot from linguistics and uh, sociology and discourse analysis, conversation analysis. And that book is a really great introduction to that. Or reach out to me. I mean, I'm always available for a conversation (laughs) and chatting with people who are interested into moving into this field. And so I'm uh, definitely open to have a quick chat. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Greg, for the conversation. (laughs) Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's been very fun. And thanks for sharing all your thoughts and your the lessons you've learned over the years. Um, My pleasure. I hope it's useful. Yeah, and good luck with the new role. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's all for this episode. We hope you liked it. Subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening to this episode. We will continue to interview people in the chat and voice spaces in different fields. Know someone who could be a good fit or have a topic request? Let us know at info at botsociety.io or at botsociety on any social media. Bot Society is a conversational design tool. With Bot Society, you can design voice and chatbot interactions in the same way you design apps and websites with Sketch or Figma. We have a free plan. Check it out on botsociety.io.